Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 312, Baton or Bust. Last time, as MacArthur realized his defensive plan to hold up the enemy at the beaches had failed, he decided to revert back to the original plan, Plan Orange. This would see a series of battle lines being thrown up between the enemy, now below Lingay and Gulf, and Manila. The last of these lines, designated D5, would be the strongest, but even this was only to gain time, so all available troops could reconvene in the Bataan Peninsula to set up the real defensive position until help came. This move would hopefully allow Washington the time it needed to bring in reinforcements, but even this effort did not start out well, as the defending forces to hand were no match for the experienced and well-supplied enemy, who also, already, controlled the skies and the waters around Luzon. No, D-5 seemed doomed to fail, as General Jonathan Wainwright, the northern commander, had asked the general for help from the Philippine division to help boost his numbers, but he was told no. Further complicating MacArthur's new defensive plan was that his logistics people had not placed stores of food or supplies within Bataan. And why should they? The general had done away with that part of the plan until now. Whereas on the island of Corregidor in Manila Bay, below Bataan, sure, stores had been put aside there for any coming battle. So now, the American logisticians and staff planners found themselves having to supply troops while they were on the move, either to one of the temporary defensive lines or on their way to Bataan, while at the same time trying to get supplies to Bataan to wait out the enemy. As there were few roads and difficult terrain along the Bataan Peninsula, this would make the Americans' job harder, but also, hopefully, slow down the Japanese, at least in theory. Either way, MacArthur was about to find out it can always get worse. With the various defensive de-designated lines being set up, while most troops fled to Bataan, the general was about to find out that General Homa was not quite done delivering surprises, as the Japanese 16th Division came ashore in the early hours of December 24th at Lamon Bay in southern Luzon, to the southeast of Manila, specifically just west of Alibat Island. This bulk of the 16th Division, led by Lieutenant General Susumu Morioka, had left the Ryukus Islands, located just south of Kyushu, the southernmost of Japan's four main islands, on December 17th, carried by 24 transports. Again, as the U.S. Navy had pretty much departed, the invading fleet safely entered Lamon Bay. On board were about 7,000 soldiers, and they would land at three different locations, from north to south, Malbon, Antimonon, and Siain. The good news for MacArthur, relatively speaking, was that in those areas were waiting parts of the 1st Regular Division, known as the Tabak Division, the only regular Philippine Army unit, along with the Philippine 51st Division, commanded by Brigadier General Albert M. Jones. The bad news was that the defenders were widely dispersed in trying to cover so much territory. Additionally, though the Filipino troops could not know this, the invading 16th Division was not at full strength. As the 16th Division did not enjoy a reputation for being a tough fighting force, though its men had seen some action in China, General Homa had decided that the Kimura Detachment a part of this same 16th Division, which had landed previously at Legaspi, would move north to help in this latest attack. And at this moment, MacArthur's altering of the defensive plan came back to haunt him. The forces in southern Luzon were expected to hold back the invaders, at least long enough for other troops to make for Bataan. However, before this change, the general had ordered Brigadier George M. Parker Jr., commander of the Southern Luzon Forces, to hold back the Kimura Detachment further south. But, just before the 16th landed, Parker had been told to begin pulling his men out, 
to make for Bataan. So when the 16th landed, the defending troops were on the move, the exact opposite of a stationary, ready defense. But that was only the beginning of the defenders' problems. In addition, they had no artillery, were ill-equipped, and the enlisted troops only spoke the local languages, but their officers spoke Tagalog and English, a perfect storm of circumstances that led to an imperfect defense. Still, the Philippine troops would have the assistance of Mount Banahao in between the enemy's landings and Manila. But first things first. The most northern of these three landings was at Mauban, level with the southern tip of Laguna Bay, itself just below Manila. And it was here that elements of the Philippine 1st Regular Division were able to jump back into their beach trenches, ready to take on the invaders. As the sun came up on December 24th, elements of the 16th Division came ashore and the Filipino first engaged them, causing significant casualties. But this had been possible mostly due to the element of surprise. As the minutes went by, more Japanese troops came ashore. The Allies had no way of stopping this, which put more pressure on the local troops. Too much pressure. Soon, by 8 a.m., the defenders were falling back. Thirty minutes later, the town of Mauban had been lost. Trying to help, American fighters, P-40s and P-35s, came in, now based in Bataan, but they were unable to change the momentum of the battle. Further, their attacks on the transports themselves achieved little. The other two landing forces met much less resistance and were able to meet up with the Kimura Detachment on December 27th, trapping the retreating forces that had left Legaspi. With the Battle of the Coast won, the Japanese sent units past the initial defensive line. Some went to the southwest, to Tayabas Bay, on the other coast, to cut off any defending troops further south, while others sought a way to get around Mount Banahao by swinging below it to then head north on Route 1, which led to Manila. So concentrated on the various pieces of his invasion, General Homa only realized, on Christmas Eve, that the war for Manila was almost over. The 48th Division, which had landed along Lingayen Gulf, was barely being held up by the Allies and were now only some 100 miles from the capital. Also, the leading reconnaissance units of the 16th Division, making good speed on Route 1 heading north, were actually a bit closer to Manila than the 48th. Everything was falling into place. The view from the opposite side of this game board was much more depressing. For MacArthur, he now found himself having to orchestrate a careful withdrawal of his northern and southern forces. If one force pulled away from the enemy much faster than the other, the enemy would be able to focus its numbers on that lone force, guaranteeing its destruction, which would truly be the end of everything. No, it would be best to have both forces keep their respective adversary in check while moving ever towards Bataan. And making this possible, the various divisions of the southern force, though pushed back, had not been shattered. Hence, they were able to begin to use the rough terrain behind their initial beach positions. The first regular division moved back, due west, reaching Los Banos, directly below Laguna Bay, just above Mount Makiling, itself just behind the larger Mount Banahao. For along the southern shoreline of the bay was Manila Road, the most direct route to the capital. While the 1st Division bottled up that route, the 51st Division positioned itself just south of the 1st, and they were covering Route 1 below Mount Makiling which swung wide of the height, then north, to make for the capital. This was the best the defenders could do for the moment. The question was, would it work? Helping the two infantry divisions was the only mobile unit the Filipinos had, Company C of the 194th Tank Battalion. But if these forces thought they were successfully stalling the main southern invasion force, 
they were mistaken. As there had been three enemy landings, the most northern one at Malbon, made up of the 2nd Battalion of the 20th Infantry Regiment, was only covering the right flank of the main force, who landed at Antimonan. Covering the main attack's left flank was the 1st Battalion of the 20th Infantry Regiment, who had landed at Siane. It would be some of these men that met up with the Kimura Detachment, dooming all Allied troops south of them. Others had been sent southwest to the other side of the narrow strip of land, thus further cutting off any Filipino troops to the south. As for the main attack, this group, the bulk of the 20th Infantry Regiment, came ashore two miles south of Antimonan. With them was the 16th Reconnaissance Regiment and the 22nd Field Artillery. Waiting for them were local defenders, who engaged right away. But again, the invaders were too well armed, organized, and besides, had air power to boot. By 11 a.m., the town of Antimonan was taken. While this fighting had been going on, the 16th Reconnaissance Regiment had skirted due west, around the conflict, and made for the next target, about eight miles away, the town of Malikboy. There, waiting, were more men of the Philippine 52nd Division. Actually, the men of the 52nd were not so much waiting as still fortifying their position. As such, the Japanese Reconnaissance Regiment, with the help of the Imperial 8th Air Regiment, were able to make short work of these defenders. To the best of their ability, the defenders then set up their next line of defense, about four miles further west of Malik Boy, along a river near the town of Benahan. By now, it was the afternoon of Christmas Eve. Unfortunately, this latest defensive line was bent back on itself, as the main body of the Japanese 20th Infantry Regiment had cleared up all the resistors along the beach and had joined those already fighting at Benahan. When the sun went down, the American and Filipino troops retreated west, on Route 1, going about six miles to Pagbilao. The enemy was close on their tail. As the day ended, General Homa's southern Luzon attack had cost him 84 dead, with another 184 wounded, a small price to cut off and surround his enemy, provided MacArthur's boys did not reach Bataan. But that was the work of the 48th Division invading from the north. Homa was delighted with the fighting prowess of the 16th. Again, they had not distinguished themselves in China. But today, today was different. The general celebrated by showing his faith in all of his men by setting up his headquarters on land at Baong, where the northern attack had first landed. By this time, indeed, even before Christmas Eve, MacArthur had to face the truth that his men, American and Filipino, could not stand up to the Japanese troops, not in the north or south. So, if he tried to defend Manila with the bulk of his troops, they could all be killed or captured, and the city destroyed in the process. All of this was unacceptable. Hence, two days previous, on December 22nd, MacArthur had radioed General George Marshall of his intention to declare Manila an open city. Further, his headquarters, as well as the Philippine government, would move to the island of Corregidor, just below Bataan. Now, the steps before his declaring Manila an open city on December 26th was a saga in itself. As early as December 8th, the day Pearl was hit, MacArthur told Major General Richard Sutherland, his chief of staff, that his forces would have to move to Bataan, even though that was not the official defense plan at the moment. Four days later, the general told President Kazan the same thing. The president, though, was less shocked than Sutherland, as he had spent time out in the field watching his countrymen train with the Americans and could see clearly more time was needed, time they did not have. Back to December 24th, MacArthur then told Admiral Thomas Hart of his plans for the capital, hopefully that it would be saved. 
As for General Lewis Brereton, in command of MacArthur's air arm, he would leave Manila that day by a PBY Catalina and head for Java. From there, a B-17 would take him successfully to Bachelor Field, Australia. Then MacArthur sent a message to Marshall saying he would disengage my forces under the cover of darkness. For the present, I am remaining in Manila, establishing an advanced headquarters on Corregidor. Those were the general's words. Those were not the general's actions. That same afternoon, as his message, MacArthur, his wife Jean, their son Arthur, and Arthur's nanny, Ah Cha, sailed from Manila to Corregidor. They were followed by President Kazon, his wife, and the High Commissioner. The General's wife, Jean, only packed one suitcase. It was full of food and clothes for the three-year-old. As she was scanning their penthouse, she saw a small glass case that held all of her husband's medals. This was also put into the suitcase. But she also spied a small bronze vase inscribed to MacArthur from the Emperor of Japan for his service as an observer during the Russo-Japanese War. This Jean left on a table near the front door. She was hoping that when the enemy came in and saw this, they would respect the house and leave it unscathed. As for her husband, the general now on board the steamer Don Esteban had with him several heavy boxes that contained all of the American money in the Manila banks and the gold reserve of the Philippine government. Now, whether it was MacArthur's rather rose-colored view of himself or the New York Times deciding that America needed a hero during its darkest hour, the paper reported the general's departure for Corregidor as U.S. Army forces with General Douglas MacArthur personally in the field staved off Japanese advances toward Manila from both the north and south this Christmas Day. It was two days later, on December 26th, that MacArthur officially declared Manila to be an open city. However, Brigadier General Richard Marshall, the Deputy Chief of Staff, was left behind to continue sending troops and supplies to Bataan. As he was using the city in such a way, not to mention burning millions of gallons of gasoline to keep out of Japanese hands and letting thousands of Filipinos raid food supplies, again so the Japanese could not get them, General Homa felt more than justified in bombing Manila before his troops entered the city on January 2nd, 1942. With this done, the relocating of supplies that had been stashed in many places, except Bataan, was sped up. Unfortunately, the speed of the enemy's advance in the north and the south meant many caches were abandoned, left undestroyed. There simply wasn't enough time. For example, at Fort Stotzenberg, about 80 kilometers north of Manila, home of the 26th Cavalry Regiment, along with several artillery units who did their training there, the supply officers, feeling the pressure of the enemy units who were coming down after taking Rosales about 50 miles north of Fort Stotzenberg, left without taking or at least destroying 250,000 of the 300,000 gallons of gasoline there, not to mention other supplies and a few damaged aircraft. Just north of Fort Stotzenberg at Tarlac, the situation was the same. Further south at Los Banos, where we left the northern half of the defensive line in between Laguna Bay and Mount McKeeling, the troops there, with their supply officers, would bug out on December 28th when they were pressed. They, too, left vital supplies behind, which were pressed into the service of the invading Japanese. But here is where politics and personal feelings came into the picture, two factors that most commanders would agree make the job of victory harder, but not MacArthur. First, he issued an order that said his troops, any troop, would face a court-martial if they took any of the estimated 2,000 cases of canned goods and clothing 
that belonged to Japanese wholesalers. Supposedly, this was decided after a request had come from President Kazan, which makes sense. It was the president's job to look after his people, even the Japanese civilians, but for MacArthur to go along with it, that's a bit much. First, any food left behind would probably be taken by the enemy, for that's what occupiers do. Next, every bit of food or clothes, after all the Allies were hoping to hold out for weeks or months, would have helped compensate for the other situation MacArthur found himself in. Before the Japanese landed, the general had ordered that some 18,000 tons of supplies be moved closer to Lingayen Gulf, where the initial fighting would take place. But with the war shifting as it had, those tons of supplies now needed to be taken back south into the Bataan Peninsula. But again, the few roads, once the peninsula was entered, mixed with the pressure placed by the enemy and the lack of vehicles, was making this close to impossible. As for that last part, time would show that local troops, and who can blame them, were confiscating vehicles, but not to transport supplies to Bataan, but to transport themselves to wherever the enemy was not. The worst example of this was at Kabanatuan, about 75 kilometers or 46 miles due north of Manila. Here, again per President Kazan, the Allied troops left behind 50 million bushels of rice, which would have lasted them for about five years. The Japanese troops who confiscated this were most grateful. All these supply issues came together to haunt the next part of MacArthur's plan, to hold out in the Bataan Peninsula. For the truth was, many more men and women would make their way there than anticipated. The Philippine Division, Air Force personnel, though most no longer had planes to service, naval personnel who had been left behind, and many desperate civilians, those who did not want to be left to the tender mercies of the Japanese troops. In summation, there would be many more people than planned for and much less food than hoped for. Meanwhile, General Wainwright in the north had to find a way of holding the enemy up at the Argo River for as long as possible, while simultaneously keeping the roads below him open so troops and supplies could be moved to Bataan. No surprise, his various de-designated defensive lines would not be as strong as Wainwright had hoped. Still, until the end of December, Wainwright and his forces, the Philippine 11th, 21st, and 91st Divisions, along with the mutilated 26th Cavalry Regiment and the American Provisional Tank Group of two M3 tank battalions, held up, though retreating all the while, the Japanese 48th Division in the central Luzon Plain. This was better than expected, but far from perfect. The armored units and the local infantrymen did not always coordinate effectively. The tanks would act as roadblocks while the infantry retreated to the south. Sadly, this did not always work out, like at Moncada, about 20 miles south of Lingayen Gulf, where 15 M3 Stuart tanks had to be abandoned as they reached the bridge in the area, only to find it already blown by the panicked infantrymen who owed their successful retreat to the tank crews. Next time, we'll see how the Japanese 48th Division was able to break through the Argo River defense line and triumph over Wainwright, who, to his credit, delivered a few small miracles in the defense of Manila. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Sorry this took so long to come out. Uh, a lot of things going on here, but nothing really bad. So, But again, I apologize. I'll try to get back to my weekly schedule. Just wanted to take a minute and say hi to some new members and thank those who have uh, donated. So as far as the new members that I'm welcoming aboard, uh, there's James Tussing from Columbus, Ohio, Kevin Stone from 
Hazlingdon, UK. Sorry, Kevin. Uh, Nico Macris from London, UK. Brian Barched from Largo, Florida. And as far as the people that have made donations, I'd like to say hi and thank you to Gerard O'Hurley from County Kilkenny in Ireland. And uh, there's another donation that just came through from Buffalo Storage. So Buffalo Storage, thank you very much. One other donation was from Steve um, Heisjulian. Sorry, Steve, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name. I apologize. And I just got a message from uh, Jack Walter, who listens on Spotify. He told me about a couple of episodes missing. I will look into that. But for right now, Jack, you might want to find those other episodes uh, on a different platform for now, and I'll, I'll see what I can do. So again, I'll try to get back to the weekly schedule because we were humming along there for a while, um, and I will be back as soon as I can. Before this week is out, there will be another membership episode as well, so just to let you members know. And I will see you all soon. Take care, everyone. Hurry in during Ram Truck Month and discover what it truly means to drive a truck that's built to serve. Ram 3500 with an available legendary Cummins engine. Ram TRX, the most horsepower of any gas pickup ever built. And Ram 1500, ranked number one in driver appeal among large light duty pickups in 2022. That's three years in a row by JD Power. Hurry in during Ram Truck Month. For JD Power 2022 U.S. award information, visit jdpower.com awards.